In the final months of the Second World War, elite groups of Allied agents and commandos infiltrated Germany. Their top secret missions to hunt down Hitler's so-called wonder weapons and the scientists who built them. We weren't looking for Lord Hawhorn, we weren't looking for Himmler, we weren't looking for Hitler, we were looking for strictly people of intelligence interest. As the Allies advanced into northern Europe, there were fears that Hitler might retaliate in a final act of revenge. Intelligence reports suggested Nazi scientists were building weapons of mass destruction. But would Hitler dare to unleash them? It was urgent because if Hitler had the bomb, we'd all be speaking German today, probably. In a prelude to the Cold War, the Americans and British began a secret race with the Russians to round up German scientists. The stakes could not have been higher. The winners could develop Hitler's wonder weapons to control the post-war world. June the 6th, 1944. D-Day, the greatest amphibious invasion in history. But the future of World War II still hung in the balance. Behind the scenes, Allied intelligence was anxious that Hitler might be plotting his revenge. Seven days after D-Day, the fears were confirmed. A strange object, travelling at 400 miles an hour, appeared in the skies over London. At first, it was thought to be some kind of plane. Only after it plummeted to Earth did they realise what this was. A flying bomb. Over the next four days, hundreds more rained down on London. One hit on June the 18th killed 121 people. This was the first of Hitler's vengeance weapons better known as the V-1. The Allies had nothing like this in their arsenal, and there seemed to be no way of stopping it. And if Hitler's scientists could create something like the V-1, what other terrifying devices were they building? Hitler was casting around for the weapon that would win the war. He thought it might be the V-1, and they were doing it lot of highly exotic and important projects in those last few months of the war. The Nazi leadership had always seen the importance of technology and invested huge amounts of money into rockets, aeroplanes, even motor racing. Consequently, German cars dominated racing in the 1930s. But Hitler was rewarded with many other scientific firsts. Perhaps the greatest and most dangerous was in atomic physics. Nuclear fission was first discovered in Germany. Some of the best German physicists were Jewish and were forced to flee the country by the Nazis. Most of them travelled to the United States where they brought the alarming news that Germany might be working on an atom bomb. This warning prompted the Pentagon to launch a top-secret effort to build their own bomb codenamed the Manhattan Project. The whole project was built on fear. We were, the Manhattan Project was actually built because we were afraid. And it would have, if, if, if the fear had become a reality, it would have, would have destroyed the United States. Robert Furman was working in the Pentagon when he was recruited to coordinate a secret mission going into Europe. The plan was to send in special agents to locate and shut down Hitler's atomic program as quickly as possible. There was one key target the agents had to find, the leading German physicist and head of the Nazi atomic bomb project, Werner Heisenberg. The mission would need elite agents on the ground to hunt for Heisenberg in the German bomb facility. Marty Previty was one of those secret agents. When this photograph was published in 1947, they blocked out my face because I was a special agent of the counterintelligence corps and I was supposed to be 
Encarnero. To give the agents license to operate wherever they wanted, they carried special passes with the highest security clearance. The purpose of visit, investigate intelligence targets, remove documents, equipment or personnel. This was my authorization to do whatever, whatever I needed to do, capture people or whatever. These passes would later prove invaluable to allow them to travel beyond the Allied front lines. There was a further objective, just as important as the scientists. The Allies knew the Nazis had amassed thousands of tons of uranium, the essential ingredient in an atom bomb. Fearing they planned to use this in their own bomb, the Allies wanted to gather up Germany's extensive reserves of this scarce element. The Manhattan Project needed to stockpile uranium for their own bomb, so their special agents had orders to track down the Nazis' hidden hoard. The mission was given a code name, Alsos. The true meaning of the name was kept a closely guarded secret from nearly everyone, especially General Groves, head of the Manhattan Project. But it was, it was a great, good many years later that, that it was revealed that Alsos was Greek for a grove of trees. Now, I think General Groves would have shivered in his shirt if, if he had known it at the time, but we really named the project, the mission after him. As the Alsos agents prepared to go into Northern Europe, Britain was beginning to deal with the V-1. New anti-aircraft batteries and barrage balloons intercepted the vengeance weapons as they flew in. And Britain's fighter pilots, whose planes were faster and more agile, were also learning how to destroy the flying bomb. But the panic was by no means over. Just when it seemed the British had finally defeated the V-1, German scientists were about to fire an even more terrifying vengeance weapon at London. This is German test footage of the newest device in Hitler's secret arsenal, the V-2 rocket. The V-2 was a huge leap forward in the history of weaponry, according to military analyst Robert Hewson. The significance of, of the V-2 is that for the very first time, uh, human engineering was able to launch a guided projectile that would travel several hundred miles and hit a point more or less where you had aimed it. This was a wonder weapon insofar as once you had a successful launch and the missile went in the right direction, you could not stop it. A mixture of alcohol and liquid oxygen propelled the rocket 200 miles in less than five minutes. It carried a one-ton warhead capable of flattening a city block. The real technological advance was the V2's guidance system. Gyroscopes controlled vanes in the exhaust, which steered the rocket towards its target. The Germans had successfully launched the world's first ballistic missile. Britain, America and Russia had nothing like this in their own armories and they were all desperate to get their hands on the rocket and the man who built it, Werner von Braun. Von Braun was one of a, a group of quite visionary scientists. People who had a dream of space flight, they, they were almost crazy people because from the really primitive rocket technology that existed at the time, they were dreaming of voyages to the stars, and that's particularly true of von Braun. Hitler wanted von Braun to test his rockets as weapons. Von Braun was so keen to support Hitler's plans that he not only joined the Nazi party, but also became an honorary major in the SS. Konrad Dannenberg was one of von Braun's protégés in rocket propulsion. He was in his late twenties when he first met the legendary father of rocketry. I was uh, really impressed by him. He was not only a good technical person, a good engineer, he was also a good manager. And he always stressed that really the work we did was teamwork. 
and he just happened to be the team leader. Each of the Allies wanted to be first to capture von Braun and his deadly rockets. They all realized this was the future of warfare. Fierce bombing raids over the V2's main research establishment had forced the German rocket men to move to a secret location. Intelligence on the whereabouts of von Braun or his new rocket factory was scarce. The British had other top Nazi scientists in their sights. A special commando unit, codenamed 30 AU, was set up by Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond. One of his agents was Charles Wheeler, now a veteran BBC correspondent. He was regarded as a by the by the naval officers. And I think the Marines, 38 years, was somebody who had really spent most of the war going to nightclubs and having expensive lunches and so on. So he wasn't really quite one of us. While Ian Fleming continued his lavish London lifestyle, the hardened commandos of 30 AU sped into northern France. They were carrying a black book, a list of hundreds of targets compiled by British intelligence. We weren't looking for Lord Haw Haw, we weren't looking for Himmler, we weren't looking for Hitler, we were looking for strictly people of intelligence interest. The Black Book had names, targets, places, people, and, uh, you know, the most important were the scientists, the German scientists. Their top target was Helmut Walter, the inventor of an amazing new form of aircraft propulsion. This was an aircraft engine for a Messerschmitt, which really was so advanced that uh, neither the British or Americans had anything like it. It had a rate of climb. It could go six miles up in two minutes. This film archive, seen for the first time on television, shows Walter taking high-ranking Nazis on a tour around his factory. Like von Braun's rockets, Walter's research was extremely attractive to the Third Reich. But his technology was equally desirable to the Allies, according to defence historian Matthew Utley. The technology under development by Walter was a significant area of interest for the Allies. And in many ways, the Admiralty saw this as the jewel in the crown of German wartime innovation and something that needed to be developed and pursued in the United Kingdom. In the final months of 1944, the British and American scientific missions raced through France as fast as the Allied armies could advance. But the key scientific targets still lay within Germany itself. Soon, they would have to face a new threat. Over in the east, the Russian Red Army was making rapid progress through Poland, heading for the German border. They were also keen to hunt down the best Nazi scientists. Although officially allies, there was an unspoken but deep mistrust between America, Britain and Russia. The allies were unified by the common purpose of defeating Germany. But as the war began to draw to a close, frictions and fissures did begin to emerge that had been there throughout the Second World War, but that were becoming uh, more apparent as it was evident that Germany was in the throes of being defeated. In February 1945, with the Nazis crumbling, the three leaders met at Yalta and agreed to divide Germany into three zones of occupation, but the planned zones increased the urgency of the hunt for Hitler's scientists. Many of the areas under Russian control would contain scientific targets, and the Red Army was now in striking distance of these key sites. Within weeks of Yalta, the British and Americans crossed the River Rhine and fanned out across Germany, hoping to reach their targets before the Russians. Intelligence reports suggested that Werner von Braun had moved his V-2 rocket factory into the centre of Germany. The trail was leading to the small town of Nordhausen. On the morning of the 11th of April 1945, an American team arrived at these hills where they made a breathtaking discovery. Hidden underground was von Braun's secret factory, where thousands of V-2 rockets were being built. The scale was immense. Two main tunnels, each over a mile long, were connected by 46 smaller tunnels. Known as the Mittelweg, 
It was the world's largest underground factory. The Americans were amazed by what they had stumbled across. Arriving there must have been a bit of a Tutankhamun moment for the American troops. They knew it existed, and they had a vague idea of what was going on there, but suddenly they were in an Aladdin's cave because they found the assembly lines, which were untouched, undamaged by bombing, and there were dozens of intact weapons. Scientific teams descended on the Mittelwerk, delighted to find this technological treasure trove. Today, these tunnels are all that remain of the huge underground complex. The production was on a production line, on a conveyor belt, yes. It moved on, and you had to attend to it at your own workplace and do your work before it moved on. It was an assembly line that, that continued day and night. These rare photographs reveal the scale of von Braun's operation. Over 4,000 V2s had been produced in less than nine months. But nothing could have prepared the Americans for how the weapons were built. The Nazis used thousands of slave laborers to work in the tunnels. One of them was Andrew Herskovitz, just 14 years old when he first came here. In the tunnel, just being there was a terrible punishment because we were cold and hungry and tired all the time. And it was terrible, it was horrible. There were beatings for any minor infringement of discipline. The punishment for sabotage was death by hanging. Of course, almost anything could be classed as sabotage. The workers were housed here in a concentration camp specially built to supply labor for the tunnels. When the Americans liberated the camp, they witnessed at first hand the true cost of the German rocket program. Over 10,000 prisoners had died manufacturing V2s, nearly twice the number killed by the rocket. I personally think that we were not expected to survive more than one year as maybe the food was calculated to last, make us last one year and then to die. One slice of bread and a little, a little bit of soup, so-called soup, which didn't have any nourishment in it. And with the bread we got a little pat of margarine and either a tiny bit of so-called sausage or some kind of jam substance and that was that was to last for the whole day so we were permanently in a state of starvation yeah. like most of the rocket engineers working there Conrad Dannenberg accepts no responsibility. Of course, in a way, I was amazed when I saw the poor KZ uh, people working in the Mittelwerke. I did not see any atrocity so. I did not see that they were punished, that they were beaten, as uh, many people claim. Now, I don't want to deny that it happened, but it certainly did not happen in my presence. Of course, the facilities were very poor, the uh, particularly toilet facilities were uh, today certainly very unacceptable. For us, of course, it was everything was wrong. Um, but for this rocket engineer, of course, he was well fed, well clothed, 
well paid, secure. Uh, of course, there was nothing wrong for him. <laughs> he probably never had it so good before. While American medical teams tended to the abandoned prisoners, other crews were busy shipping out rockets and equipment, desperate to transport it back to the States. They were unable to completely strip the underground factory before the Russians arrived. The Red Army found there was still plenty of material for them to cart away. Both sides now had the rockets, but they still needed the brains that created them. Their number one target, Werner von Braun, had disappeared with over a hundred members of his rocket team. He was rumored to be on his way south, to Bavaria. Several hundred miles away, the agents chasing the German atomic bomb project continued their hunt for Werner Heisenberg. Captured documents had led them to a town called Heigerloch. No one knew how far the Nazis had gone with building a bomb, but they had heard of a flurry of secret activity revolving around a cave underneath the town's castle. The agents found the cave easily enough, but the heavy steel door was padlocked. The colonel in charge, Boris Pash, who died in 1995, described how they eventually got inside the curious cave. A paper stuck on the door indicated the manager's identity. Get the fellow whose name is on that paper, I ordered. They combed the town, searching for the manager. Pash was desperate to get his hands on what lay within the cave and was prepared to do anything. When the manager was brought to me, he tried to convince me that he was only an accountant. When he hesitated at my command to unlock the door, I said, shoot the lock off. If he gets in the way, shoot him. The manager gave in and opened up the cave. What Alsos discovered inside was so significant, it has now been turned into a museum. Deep in the rocks underneath the castle, the German physicists had built a nuclear reactor. Uranium cubes were lowered into a tank and bombarded with neutrons in an attempt to achieve a chain reaction, unleashing a tremendous amount of energy. Heisenberg's team were just short of enough uranium. A few more tons, and the reactor might have worked. Colonel Pash still needed to interrogate Heisenberg, but their top target had disappeared and was last seen heading for Bavaria to join his family. When the agents started to dismantle the reactor, they were shocked to discover the vital uranium was missing. Marty Previty's men quickly rounded up most of the other German scientists to try to make them talk. We captured physicists and interrogated them and they confessed that they had, they had a stockpile of uranium and they buried it, tried to hope that they could hide it and keep it away from us. After three days of questioning, the German physicists finally talked. They directed the interrogators to a field just outside the town. Wary of booby traps, Marty enlisted the help of a local German. After several hours of digging, they finally hit the jackpot. They unearthed more than two tons of uranium buried outside Heigerloch. The Air Force flew it to Great Britain. It's very heavy stuff, so it took 20 of these planes flying round trip several times to carry that much stuff over there. Most of the valuable uranium was now in Allied hands. But Hitler's top scientists were still at large. A few days before the end of the war, British Intelligence Unit 30 AU was racing to capture one of Hitler's top scientists. Their target, rocket plane designer Helmut Walter, was behind enemy lines in the port of Kiel. To get hold of Walter by six marines actually went ahead of the army to 
together with, I think, the SAS and went straight to Walter's headquarters. They knew where it was. And there was Walter. And he was extremely uncooperative at first. Um, and then after a couple of days, suddenly decided he might as well open up everything he had. Walter had been working on a radical aircraft, which the British were anxious to learn more about. They also needed someone brave enough to try flying this machine. Test pilot Eric Brown was the man for the job. A legend in aviation, Eric Brown has flown more types of aircraft than anyone else in history. When he flew into Germany in the last days of the war, he was shocked by what he found. It was like walking into Aladdin's cave as regards advanced aircraft. The airfields we visited were mostly in a state of chaos. But the strange thing was, much to our astonishment, they had not touched any of their advanced jet or rocket aircraft. Now, my only explanation for this is that they were so proud of their achievements in this sector that they wanted us to see what was available, what might have been. Eric came face to face with one of the strangest looking aircraft in the German Luftwaffe, the Messerschmitt 163, with its rocket engine, designed by Walter. It was an airplane that made the adrenaline flow, certainly exuded a great challenge to fly. It had a number of revolutionary, innovative features. It had swept wings, but above all, it was rocket powered and it landed on a skid. Eric was desperate to discover how the ME163 worked, but the more he found out about it, the more he realized this would be a dangerous test flight. The, the rocket that Walter designed for that aircraft was a very clever piece of engineering. It was small, it was light, and it was powerful. But because it used an explosive mix of fuels, two substances, C-stuff and T-stuff, that when mixed together, essentially explode and power the rocket, uh, it was known by its pilots as a flying bomb. The two fuels mixed together to produce eight minutes of rocket power. The plane could climb 20,000 feet in under two minutes, so it could launch surprise attacks on enemy bombers. The pilot sat in a cockpit surrounded by rocket fuel. It was not a plane for the faint-hearted. Over ten German pilots had died attempting to fly the 163. Most were killed during takeoff or landing. But this didn't seem to worry Eric Brown. I was encouraged by the boffins who were in on the act to um have a go at this. And there was nobody around to stop us. That was, that was the real thing. The noise really was ear splitting. And um, one felt, as you sat in this, with this aircraft rocking under this bar, it was like unleashing an atom bomb, I think. And uh, I think one has to say, you felt a little apprehensive about what was lying ahead, but the temptation was so huge to have a go at this thing. Eric Brown became the first and only Allied pilot to fly this rocket-powered plane. It was rather like being in charge of a runaway train. I felt I'd never had this feeling with any other airplane that it was a, a jump ahead of me all the time. And um, I was catching up with it. It really took your breath away. Having assessed the plane and captured the man who designed it, the British were now ready to exploit this new rocket technology. By now, most of Germany had fallen to the Allies. The Red Army had surrounded Berlin and were beginning to push towards the centre. 
60 miles away, American and Russian troops met up for the first time on the river Elbe. In front of the cameras, both sides behaved like the best of friends. But behind the scenes, the battle for Germany's spoils was now at its most intense. Once the German collapse really began to get going, there was a huge sort of flurry of activity. There were so many targets, everybody was rushing around in all directions, securing stuff, looking for stuff, finding stuff, failing to find stuff, um, uh, denying or trying to deny as much as possible uh, to the Russians, preventing the Russians getting there first and making off with it and nobody ever seeing it again. Lots of competition. Both sides knew the real prizes. Hitler's top scientists had fled to mountain retreats in Bavaria, in the south of Germany. Nuclear physicist Werner Heisenberg and rocket engineer Werner von Braun had come here to shelter from the fierce fighting in the north. They also wanted to be as far away as possible from the advancing Russian front. Racing through Bavaria, the Americans hoped to be the first to capture von Braun and his team of rocket specialists. But the German rocketeers were already making their own plans. We had some uh, top secret meetings with von Braun and some of his uh, closest staff members to talk about the question, what do we do at the end of the war? We had considered, should we turn ourselves over to the Russians. And there were some indications that the Russians were possibly interested in rocketry, but uh, we had heard so many bad things about the Russians. And I think we all realized that with the V2, we had made a major new contribution to high technology. And so we had hoped at least that this situation would help us to survive the war and to do something after the war which would be worthwhile. Von Braun realized his rocket team's unique knowledge could guarantee them VIP treatment when the war ended. On the day after the announcement of Hitler's death, the German rocket men emerged from hiding. In his mad dash south, von Braun had broken his arm in a car accident. They were relieved to be surrendering to the Americans rather than the Russians. Von Braun was dispatched to the United States. His future designing rockets now seemed assured, provided his involvement with the SS and his use of slave labor was overlooked. Fifty miles to the east, the agents chasing atom scientist Werner Heisenberg were also closing in. They were far in advance of American frontline troops, and the SS were known to be active in the area. Colonel Boris Pash realized it would be dangerous to go much further. Was I to hold up until the infantry could join us? Or should I go on in the manner of past operations? I decided to plunge ahead. I felt then, as I do now, that the urgency drummed into us by Washington justified the advance. In fact, made it imperative. Heisenberg was at his family's home, above the Valkensee Lake. His son Jochen was six years old at the time and can remember the Americans approaching. It was clear that the American troops were advancing here and my father moved quite often up the hill to look where he could see fighting going on and uh, he informed and also the people that uh, most likely the Americans would be coming. Avoiding the SS, Colonel Pash and his men advanced on Heisenberg's house. On May the 3rd, they finally captured their number one target. I remember that at that time I was visiting with my father uh, by uh, my grandmother there came a call saying that my father should come back to his house immediately. Then I came up here and we did see uh, American soldiers. 
They were here on the terrace and seemed very friendly. Heisenberg was sent back to England for interrogation. But it would be several months before Hitler's top physicist revealed how much he knew about building an atom bomb. Four days after Heisenberg's capture, Germany surrendered. In Berlin, life was beginning to settle down after five years of war. As Britain, America and Russia took over their zones of occupation, the relationship between the Allies reached a new low point. British Commando Unit 30 AU was operating in the city and received a frosty reception from the Russians. It was very, very touchy and difficult and people had to be pretty careful that it never broke out into any kind of violence and I don't think it ever did. But this became a sort of mutual hostility. I mean, that's where... I first became conscious of the fact that there was a Cold War just a few weeks after the war ended. We were into the Cold War. The Russian hostility was understandable. 30 AU were hardly in Berlin on a peace mission. Their agents were now making trips deep inside the Russian zone on clandestine operations to smuggle the wives and families of the captured scientists over to the West. We actually um, dressed a German woman up as a British female eight years officer and drove her through um, two Russian checkpoints from West Berlin through Helmstedt into West Germany. She was a good actress, and she spoke a little bit of English, but fortunately she wanted no, nobody spoke to her, so she was all right, and the Russians probably wouldn't have known anyway. Having been reunited with their families, key German scientists were then brought over to Britain. Helmut Walter, inventor of the rocket engine for the ME-163, came to the north of England to continue working with an all-German team of scientists. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, massive shipments of German scientific materials, technology and research were boxed up and taken to Britain, America and Russia. As for uranium seized by the Alsos mission in places like Heigerloch, over a thousand tons was shipped back to America's Manhattan Project, who were building a huge stockpile for their own atomic bomb research. Alsos's number one target, Werner Heisenberg, and nine other German physicists were interned at a country house in England. In a last-ditch attempt to find out more about the Nazi bomb project, secret microphones were placed around the house to eavesdrop on the Germans. The scientists gave little away until a radio broadcast on the 6th of August 1945 shocked them into talking. Here is the news. Early this morning, the most destructive power invented by man was unleashed on Japan, the atomic bomb. Immediately, the physicists tried to work out how the Americans had done it. The hidden microphones recorded Heisenberg's deliberations. He seemed to completely misunderstand bomb physics. His wartime design for an atom bomb called for thousands of kilograms of uranium, while the Hiroshima bomb used just 56. To the British and Americans listening in, this finally explained why the German bomb project never succeeded. Shortly afterwards, Heisenberg was released and returned to Germany. He was no longer considered a threat. Three months after VE Day, the 15th of August was declared victory in Japan, VJ Day. 
Far into the night, the happy crowd screamed their relief at the end of the greatest war in history. New York never celebrated like this before, but never did they have a better reason. The war may have been over, but the race to exploit German technology was still on. A few weeks after VJ Day, Eric Brown flew home in a German plane. It's quite an exciting uh, feeling because you feel what a turn for the books, isn't it? Well, um, any German aircraft coming over that way was met by barrage from the White Cliffs. But here we were bringing their um, most prized aircraft back without any particular problems. The plane that Eric was flying was much more important than the dangerously explosive rocket plane he had tested earlier. This aircraft would have a major influence on the Cold War. The Messerschmitt 262 was the world's first operational jet fighter. It's in many ways quite sinister looking with this shark um, aspect and it really looked as if it could cause a lot of trouble, very lethal looking airplane big engines and the underside of the shark is absolutely flat the whole thing is all aimed at minimum drag maximum speed German air crews had boasted that the ME262 was over a hundred miles an hour faster than anything the Allies had we checked this at Farnborough and found their figures were quite accurate the top speed of this aircraft was 568 miles an hour. At this time, our top fighter had a top speed of 446 miles an hour. So here you're going from 446 to 568. It's a huge, a quantum leap, really. The 262 could have changed the course of the war, but it came too late for the Nazis. It was certainly going to have an impact on future conflicts. Over in America, engineers were also learning from the German aircraft to help them build their own jet fighter. There's a, a famous story about the head of aerodynamic design for North American aircraft who put himself through night school to learn German so that he could really understand what he was reading. And then his design team got access to a 262. And from the practical aircraft and the designs that they were looking at, they completely junked their own design for the XP-86 and redrew it as a swept wing aircraft with the classic 35 degree swept wing that became the Sabre, one of the greatest jet fighters of that age. With the Sabre, the Americans thought that they had built the most advanced aircraft in the world. What they didn't know was that the Russians had found exactly the same set of German data and used it to build their own swept-wing jet plane, the MiG-15. In December 1950, the two planes met for the first time in the Korean War. When the first Russian MiG-15s appeared over Korea, it was a, a tremendous shock, and American pilots thought they were being attacked by American aircraft. The, the confusion in those early days was immense. American pilots couldn't believe what they were seeing. The MiGs were practically indistinguishable from the Sabres. It seems quite clear that both the Russians and Americans were reading from the same script. A similar thing was happening with rocket technology. Since being brought to America, Werner von Braun and his V-2 team had been hard at work building rockets for the USA. Over a hundred German rocket men were given contracts to teach American engineers everything they knew. The US government had strict rules about employing former Nazis, so inconvenient facts like von Braun's SS membership were swept under the rug. Thousands of documents about the German rocket men were removed, many of which are still suppressed from the public today. With von Braun on their side, America was confident it was ahead of the world. Then, on October the 4th, 1957, that confidence was shattered. A Soviet R-7 missile 
launched into space with the world's first satellite, Sputnik. Sputnik's bleeping message as it circled the Earth was not lost on the USA. If the Russians could fire an object into orbit, they could also fire a nuclear warhead at the United States. The USA turned to Von Braun. By the mid-60s, both America and Russia had thousands of missiles pointing at each other. All descended from Von Braun's original V2 design. Von Braun's crowning achievement was leading NASA's Apollo mission to put man on the moon. The American and Russian space programs were both built on German science. In the rush to capitalize on Nazi know-how, both sides chose to forget the scientists' past. When I heard that they were fated and treated as national heroes in the United States, I was outraged and, and disgusted. And I thought it was not only showing disrespect to us, but to their own dead. Thousands and thousands of American soldiers died liberating Europe to defeat Hitler. And these people were the mainstays of Hitler's reign of terror. And there they were being fated like heroes. Disgusting. One of the Cold War's greatest successes will forever be darkened by the shadow of von Braun's past. The underground hell where Hitler's wonder weapons were built. <laughs>